Well, hey, Summit family, it is so good to be back with you. And uh, we're starting up our gear groups again. And uh, everything is back and rolling. And boy, uh, have we been through a lot. And when I say we, I mean maybe just me, but uh, maybe all of you as well. When you think about all of the different things that are going on in our country, so much has transpired, some of it very interesting, some of it very troubling maybe. Uh, and Lori and I had our own challenges with COVID, as most of you know by now. And I just thank God that he sustained me and Lori and is in control not only of my life, but he's in control of the entire universe. Isn't that comforting to know? But I just go, whew, what a whirlwind, man, since uh, mid-November, mid late October time frame. But it's great to be back, and I'm excited to be here with you. This is week number 11 Chapter number 10 of the story, and by the way, uh, I am going to continue with the numbering series just like that, even though we've had a break. So we're going to call this week 11, chapter 10, and we're going to press on. And hopefully you've read chapter 10 by now, uh, but uh, if you haven't, just listen along, and then you can go back and read it afterwards, or stop the video, read it, and then come back. Either way, you want to play it. Um, just so excited to, to start this new winter-spring semester, um, so much stuff we're going to cover starting from where we left off to where you're going to get real familiar again, maybe in the New Testament, is going to be things that you haven't really probably spent a lot of time looking at if you're like most people in most churches. And uh, I just can't wait for you to be exposed to the truth and content of what's coming. It's just going to be awesome and you're going to love it. Um, so just some quick reminders as we kind of fire up again. Some of you may be joining us for the first time, and if that's the case, welcome. And I'm so glad you're here because you're going to benefit a lot. What you're going to want to remember is read each chapter before we meet each week. So keep track of which uh, timing we have going on as far as which week number, which chapter number, and then make sure you read before and come ready to discuss it if you're in a, an in-home group or a Zoom group, or even if you're just discussing it amongst your family. And then regularly review and memorize the timeline, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And then attend or participate each week faithfully, whether on the online campus or in person, uh, because that's going to give you the best results and it's going to really help you with the continuity because this book called The Story is a chronological survey or overview of the entire Bible. So for continuity's sake, it's going to really help you along those lines. And then remember, invite some other folks to join you. These could be anybody. It could be family members. It could be people from out of state that don't even live in California or go to Summit because they can do it online and they can join us that way. And the more people we can expose to the truth of God's Word, the better. So this week, we start looking at the events that begin the period of the kingdom. And as you recall, we went through some other things we'll review in just a minute, but we're going to start the kingdom. And the kingdom is huge. It has so many facets to it, and we're going to be in it for several weeks as we look at each piece of how the sequence unfolds. Um, remember, again, uh, I say this all the time, but we really need to have a reminder now that remember the five things we're looking for every time we come to Scripture. Most of the time, all five are there. Some of the time, it's just one or the other. But basically, why did God give us Scripture? Well, He gave it to us to show us who He is. He needed to reveal Himself to us so we understand who God is, because God wants relationship with us. Number two, He wants to show us what He's like. What is His character like? Remember we talked about the two sides of God. We do see the forgiveness, the mercy, the grace, the holiness, all that. But we also see, you know, like I said, holiness, or we see justice, we see righteousness, wrath, and judgment. So there's all of that rolled into the character of God, number two. Number three, the Bible shows us clearly who we are. It tells us what we're like. And when you look at the characters in Scripture, understand you're looking at yourself when you see them do just about anything. So the Bible helps us understand who we are better and how God sees us. Then we have the fourth thing, which is problems, and fifth thing, which is solutions. The big problem in the Bible, of course, is sin. The big solution, of course, is God's progressively redemptive plan culminating in the person of Christ his finished work on the cross, and His triumphant resurrection, which broke the chains of sin and death. Now, there's also problems that happen in the specific text. 
and then there's solutions, and we see how God deals with that, and we learn more about what He's like, what we're like, and who He is through those things as well. So keep that in the back of your mind, and remember, we're engaging in this biblical literacy quest to uh, gain more biblical truth and knowledge for awesome, exciting, and successful kingdom living. Well, with all that said as a way to get us back into it, let me pray for us today. Lord Jesus, we come to you, and uh, this is all about you. This isn't about us taking a class. This isn't about us doing something fun. This isn't about uh, just exercising mere discipline, although it might be all those things too. But the main thing is that we're here to learn about you, honor you, exalt your name, get in line with you, and have our will align with your will so that we can have rich and full communion with you. So be with me today, strengthen my voice and my lungs and everything that was affected by my sickness. Give me strength to endure and um, help us learn a lot today as we examine your word. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks in advance. Amen. All right. Quick review of the biblical timeline, or sometimes I call this a roadmap, should be showing up on your screen. And what you're going to notice is we've come through creation and all of the events of Adam and Eve, the fall and Noah, and then we had the period of the patriarchs, which left us in Genesis, and we get into Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then that rock star Joseph to end things up in Genesis. And then we're into Exodus and Moses, and we have the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and everything that went on with God delivering His people from Egypt through the prophet Moses. And then we get into a really good time in Israel, the conquest, Joshua and, and Caleb, and the wonderful time in the book of Joshua that describes when Israel was right in sync with God. And then we kind of take, we fall off a cliff, we take a turn, and we're into the period of the Judges, which was one of the darkest periods in history. And in that book, we learned about several judges and the cycles of sin and all that that happened. And, and then, but we get a little break because he ends during that period also with the book of Ruth, which is a shining star in that period of time. And that brings us to the kingdom, which is in the bottom half of the front page of your timeline. And you can see it's going to take that whole rest of that time um, on the bottom half of that page to get through what comprises the kingdom and some of the events that happen as a result of some pretty bad disobedience along the way. So with that as a backdrop and a reminder, let's jump into chapter 10, standing tall, falling hard. What could that possibly mean? Well, we're going to take a look at that. And basically, the major characters are Samuel, and it's the rise of Saul, the first king of Israel. Remember, God always worked through prophets and judges and things before this time. He always had a point man. But now Israel's going to demand a king, and they're going to want to look just like the other nations. And um, let's just say as a foreshadowing element, it ain't going to go well. So um, let's just see what happens. The stage is kind of set here. In this section of Scripture, we see the emergence and the outcry of Israel for a king. It's a difficult time in the land, and Israel uh, and, the, and the people's hearts, they're just still far from God. We're kind of still lagging in the end part of the period of the judges, and um, they're still in the midst of this darkness, but God shows His character in a few of the characters and the circumstances nonetheless, but there is much to lament during this time. It's really still a tough time. And the sad thing about all of this is Israel doesn't want God as their king. They don't want a theocracy. They don't want to be separate and apart. They wanted to be just like the other nations and have a human king. And you can just see right from the get-go, they're, they're already becoming derailed or staying derailed. Well, the whole point of God marking off His people as the Hebrew people, a covenant in the flesh, as you recall, through circumcision and everything beginning with Abraham that we've talked about back in the fall, the whole point was them to not be like the rest of the world, but rather to be set apart, consecrated, and anointed for a special purpose. And that basic purpose was to be taking the message of God's love for them and redemption to the world. They were supposed to be a salvific element that would go out to the world, and God would work through Israel. But they missed the boat almost every time with what was going on. 
If God was going to be their king, it would have been a perfect plan, but they sidelined him. And the minds of the people were never going to really return to that. And it wasn't going to go well, and indeed it didn't. Well, the next 450 years or so were going to be a nightmare with just a few bright spots in there um, just to keep things alive, but ultimately ending uh, with God's judgment and Him using outside nations to conquer Israel and to bring death and captivity. And uh, folks, this is not a bright outlook. This next 450 years is very dismal. So just a few things by way of reference to set up the kingdom period. Uh, some key tidbits here is that uh, chapter 10 of the story covers 1 Samuel chapter 1 through 15 by way of reference. And we kind of get into the characters of Eli and Hannah and Samuel and Saul. And then chapter 11 next week is going to take us through the rest of 1 Samuel versus, or rather, chapters 16 through 31. And we're going to cover a little more about Saul. We're going to get into David and the kind of his emergence, uh, the, the conflict with the Philistines and Goliath. And then also uh, the, the chapter is going to talk about the wonderful bond of friendship between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. Well, as I mentioned, we're still in the last period of the Judges as this all begins. And the period of 1 and 2 Samuel runs from approximately, because we want to keep our timeline in, in play here, approximately 1105 to 970 B.C. And what this covers is Eli, the life of Hannah, Samuel, the rise of Saul, and then David. And then we have to get into 1 Kings, which is the book that follows that, before we see the life of Solomon, which we'll be talking about in the next week or two. Key change uh, in this whole section is that Israel is now moved from a bunch of loose-knit tribes uh, to a unified people under what I'm going to refer to, and you'll see on your timeline too, I believe. Let me just double-check real quick. Um, yes, I see it written down there on your timeline that it's a united monarchy. It's a united kingdom, and when I say that, I mean all of Israel is united under one king. So we don't have a bunch of loose factions out there or things going on. Um, if we go to the timeline, we'll also see that if we, if we move the timeline down a little bit and after Solomon, we see that it's going to be a divided monarchy or a divided kingdom where north and south split. Ten tribes go to the north. They're going to be called Israel with the capital Samaria. Two tribes, being Benjamin and Judah, go to the south, and they're going to be um, called Judah with the capital Jerusalem. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is going to be the king of that southern kingdom. Jeroboam, who revolts, is going to take the northern kingdom. And then we're going to see all the events that that's going to cause. There's a lot to talk about there. But that's by way of a little bit of foreshadowing and a preview. So as we move through the kingdom over the next few weeks, remember the five things about God that we talked about. Watch for them. And I'm going to give you a little sample here. So in 1 Samuel, we see God's character. So this would be like element number two. What is God like? And we see this in many ways. He shows up and shows us who He is and what He's like uh, in this way. In 1 Samuel, we see in chapter 2, God is holy. Chapter 14, God is powerful. Chapter 2 and 6, God is provident. We see in chapter 1, God is righteous. Chapter 9 and 16, that He is sovereign. And we see in chapter 2 that he's wise. And then in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we get a little balance of the other side of God, that second side of God where he's wrathful. And we see the fullness of God on display in just the book of 1 Samuel. It's really amazing. And then if we look at the person of Samuel, we see that he holds three offices. He's considered not only a judge in verse 7 verse 15, chapter 7 verse 15, but he's also considered the best and the last judge uh, of all of them. And he is a prophet as uh, called out in chapter 3 verse 20, and he's also a priest, chapter 2 verse 3, or chapter 2 and 3. So there's an interesting typology here, and we've talked about typology back in the fall with some other examples like with Joseph, but there's an interesting typology here because Samuel holds three offices. Later, we're going to see that our Messiah, Jesus, also holds three offices. He holds a prophet and a priest just like Samuel, but instead of a judge, Jesus is king. Amen? And so we see a little bit of typology being shown through the, the, the prophet, priest, and, and uh, judge Samuel of what would be coming with Christ. 
We also see that Eli was also considered a judge, and he led Israel for 40 years in that capacity. And additionally, he was a priest, we see in chapter 1, verse 9. It's interesting, though, isn't it, that we don't really see Eli or Samuel called out in the book of Judges as one of the judges. We see the major military judges. We see more of the administrative judges, and there's about 12 of them or so. But we don't have any mention of these guys until they appear on the timeline right in the next book of 1 Samuel. So interesting how um, we got to be careful, see, to take the, the wholeness of Scripture to get the full picture of the period of Judges, not just the book of Judges. Something to keep in mind as you develop good study habits in Scripture. Well, let's take a look at the key characters in, in the chapter here and what's going on. Um, we have this amazing woman named Hannah. I just think she's a true rock star. And as you saw from the chapter, she was a stellar woman of faith. She had perseverance under persecution. She had a rival wife and, and some of the other issues that she was dealing with. She had integrity. She, she was a woman of prayer, a woman of endurance of painful discouragement for a time. Because you remember, she couldn't bear children at first. And she also feared God and was willing to sacrifice her beloved son if God would just give her a son. And, she, and he did, and she kept her word. And she patiently petitioned God all during that difficult time in faith and honored, and, and honored God, and he in turn honored her greatly. So if you ever want to have a great study, just spend some time studying the life of Hannah and just pick apart all the elements of what she did right, and you'll be amazed. Uh, we have a lot to learn from her example. Now, Eli, hmm, kind of... Kind of a little bit of a different story. He was a judge and a priest for 40 years, as we just mentioned. But uh, he took Samuel in to serve God, and he recognized the voice of God calling Samuel before Samuel was really dialed into God and would recognize God's voice for him. Uh, we see that on the page 131 of your book. Uh, but later, Eli was severely judged and, and, and just called out by God for failing to call out and deal with the heinous sin, known sin that was going on of his sons. And later these sons were killed, and let's just say Eli developed a sudden pain in the neck, uh, and he died too. And if you read the text, you'll know what I mean by that. So what, what, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from Eli's failure? Well, you know what? When we look at our own lives, and when we look at the lives of our close friends and family, and certainly the lives within the church, um, and also reference 1 Corinthians 5 as, we, as you want to get some of this um, understood a little better. But we have to deal with the issue of sin. We have to deal with it because sin is a cancer. Sin is a poison. Uh, it's like, would you drink water from a barrel that has 55 gallons in it, but there's just a teaspoon of arsenic in it? Oh, it's probably not that much. Probably not going to hurt you. You're going to have a drink of water from that barrel? You're not, are you? Because you're not willing to risk poisoning yourself with even the smallest amount of arsenic in such a large volume of water. Well, that's what sin does in the church. That's why Jesus calls, uh, or, or, or Paul and several people, use the analogy of leaven, because leaven just, just works its way through the whole lump of dough and poisons it. And leaven is always used as an element of sin in the Bible. So similarly, a little bit of sin in the church or in your family or in your friendship circles tolerated when it's known, we need to confront lovingly and restore people. And if we don't, and if we just let it go knowingly, God is not going to be pleased with that, just like He wasn't here with Eli. So he didn't finish well. And we're going to kind of see a pattern of people not finishing well, which is a little bit um, disconcerting uh, because Finishing well really is kind of the major thing, isn't it? I mean, think about it. If you ran a marathon and you trained hard, and then 100 yards from the finish line, you ran out of gas, or you did something foolish, and you couldn't finish, does it matter how well and how fast you ran that first part of, of the, of the uh, marathon? Or if you're in a, a sprint, and you didn't stretch properly, and you come out of the gate like, like wildfire, and you're leading the pack, and then you pull a hamstring because you didn't stretch, because you were foolish. You didn't finish well. It doesn't matter how you started. 
And that's what we learned from Eli and what we're going to see pretty much with every king of the united monarchy. Well, here's a, here's a breath of fresh air. Samuel, he's judge, priest, and prophet, as we said. He's the son of Hannah. He served under Eli and was his successor as judge and in some of these other offices. Well, he ushered in the first king. He was given that because God was basically saying, hey, this is what the people want. We're going to give them what they want. We see this in 1 Samuel 8, 5, and also page 135 at the top of your book. And even after a protest of, of Samuel kind of going back and forth with God, we see that uh, he uh, finally relented and, and, and all of that. But having a king came with a warning. So I want to pull out um, our storybook. And if we could turn to page 1, uh, let's see, 135 at the top. I think, I think that's where we want to go. So here's where we see the, the story picked up with what I just said. It says, Meanwhile, Samuel insisted that the Israelites stop worship and the worship of pagan deities and return to the true God. He led the people in successfully subduing the Philistines, but the people stubbornly thought that having a king like everybody else would solve their leadership problems. See, they were focused horizontally. They weren't focused vertically on God. And this is what happens in your life and my life. Every time we do that, we usually are off in the weeds somewhere and get into trouble. Well, it says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of the firstborn was Joel, the second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. I mean, already rebellion is on its way. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. And after being reared under Samuel, I want to go, uh, really? Seriously? How does this happen? Well, the elders all came together, and they, they came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, you're old. How's that for a, a, a conversation starter? And then he says, your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint us a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. You see, they're just intent on this. But when they said, give us a king, this displeased Samuel. Middle of the page. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all the people, what they say to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Is that not crystal clear? God is going, I don't get it. All I want to do is love these people and bless them and protect them. They don't want me because they're blind and they're blinded by their own sin. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they're doing to you. It's like, you understand what I've been going through, Samuel? Well, now this is a little taste of what that's like. Welcome to the club. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what a king who will reign over them will claim as his right. So it's like, are you sure you want this? Do you know what's going to happen? Because I don't think you do. So I'm going to inform you on what's going to happen while there's still time. And you can change your mind. So here's what he says. Samuel told the words of the Lord to the people who are asking him for a king. And he says, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. Listen to this. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some will assigned, be assigned as commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties. Others will plow his ground and reap his harvest. And still others are just going to make weapons and, and, and a war equipment, basically, for the chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants, top of 136, and all the best of your cattle and donkeys he'll take for his own use. He'll take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. And guess what? But the Lord will not answer you in that day. In other words, that's the old-fashioned way of saying, you made your bed, now lie in it. And tough, you made your choice. And then it goes on to explain the people's response. But basically, they ended up saying that they didn't care. That's what they wanted anyway. 
You know, and it's just, it's just staggering that with the warning, even with the warning, this is where they found themselves. Well, this is just, um, it, it's staggering. We just see this pattern of rejection with God back with the Israelites coming out of Egypt in the wilderness. Uh, we see it during the period of the judges. Now we see this in the kingdom. And ultimately later, we're going to see Jesus rejected by the, the same people. Um, and, and yet, and yet, we see God that loves us and never gives up on, on them through it all, nor us through it all. And that ought to make you just amazed uh, at God's long suffering. And so I have to ask you the question, revisiting something we said earlier on. Are you really going to tell me there's no grace in the Old Testament? All I can say is two words, get real. Because God is loving these people through all of this and super patient. Well, then we have this person named Saul, first king of Israel. And notice the attraction and the focus of the people. He was the proverbial tall, dark, and handsome. Um, and really nothing has changed in our world, has it? Um, we, we are attracted to people who are beautiful or handsome or rich or famous or, or powerful on some level. We don't even look at their character, do we? We first look at their attractiveness and the, and the things that are pleasing to our flesh. Well, it was the same with these people. They didn't look at Saul's character. In fact, we come to see through his reign his best characteristics. Here's his best resume. Was jealousy, impatience, rebellion, and selfishness. Wow, what a list. I'd hate to see the, the tail side of that coin. And Saul represented his ancestors well. In other words, he was just like the, the Israelites that came out of Egypt and every other generation that was rebellion. He was just cut out of the same cloth. Well, he has minimal success uh, in his reign and is pretty much a monumental failure, failure to the point where God says he even regrets putting him in power and putting him in place in the first place. So we have some lessons learned from all this. Number one, sin, if you look at the life of Saul, we're going to see he, sin has consequences that don't go away just because you're forgiven. Did you know that? If you break someone's window purposefully or accidentally, you can apologize and they can forgive you, but there's still a broken window that needs to be dealt with. That's a consequence that you have to pay for that and restore it. And that's a minor example. We have all kinds of other gross examples of things much worse where Scripture is so honest it just presents it all and shows us what we're like. Number three of the five things. Number two, good intentions mean nothing if they're rooted in disobedience. It doesn't matter what you intended. If you're disobeying God from the start, you're not going to have your good intentions bear the fruit you want because you're starting off in disobedience. And we see this through and through in the book of First and Second Samuel. And then lastly, partial obedience is no obedience at all. And we're going to see that displayed um, with, with some uh, text I'm going to read to you here in just a moment uh, in Sam, uh, uh, Saul's life. So before we go to our study questions, just a couple of minutes here. Here's some excerpts regarding Saul and just kind of the dude that he was uh, from 1 Samuel 15, kind of a profile. I want to, I want to just give you a flavor. There, I'm not going to be able to get through all of it because of the time remaining, but here we go. 1 Samuel 15, 1. Then Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. So Samuel is giving him clear instruction, so clear he can't miss it. He says in verse 2, Thus the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself up against him on the way when he was coming up from Egypt. So God's coming around and going, I'm going to protect my people against this guy and what he did. Verse 3, now go, now here's the clear instruction. Now go strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. All means all, and that's all, all means. Okay, so there's no partial this, partial that. Destroy it all was the clear instruction from God. It says, don't spare him, but put him to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. In other words, wipe out this organization, this culture from the face of the earth. Verse 4, Then saw some of the people, numbered them, about 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. 
Verse 5, he came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Okay, so far so good. Verse 7, so Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Am Amalekites, alive, and he utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Uh, or did he? Okay, so now we go to uh, the, the next verse, or continuing in that verse. But Saul and the people spared Agag. Is that what God said to do? No. And they spared the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good. And they were, they were not willing to destroy them utterly. Why not? That's exactly what God said to do. But see, this is a heart of a, of a king who's not in line with God. And so basically, uh, everything that was despised and worthless, of course, they destroyed because it was no, of no value to them. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret that I made Saul king, for he's turned his back on me following, um, from following me and has not carried out my commands. And so Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. And this is just called flat out disobedience and rebellion, folks. So then in verse 13, Samuel came to Saul and said to him, blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. And it's like, really? Did you? But Samuel said, well, what is this? I'm hearing the bleeding of sheep and the sound of, of uh, oxen. Uh, what is all that about? Why am I hearing that? And then Saul goes into his excuses. Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people, spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Saul is talking to Samuel. It's for the Lord your God. He's not even claiming God as his. And he's blaming the people for what they did in sparing this. It says, but the rest we've utterly destroyed. Partial obedience is no obedience at all. Okay? So then it goes on from there. And basically, there's just a bunch of excuses. He says, why, Samuel says in verse 19, why didn't you obey the voice of the Lord? but you rushed to uh, the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey. I did. And he went on the mission and the Lord had sent me and all the different stuff and destroyed. And he goes, but the people, the people you see took some of the spoil. Oh, and they wanted to bring it to sacrifice. Oh, they meant it for good intentions. And again, the sacrifice was to your God. He still won't say to my God or our God. Samuel said, has the Lord much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed, to heed instruction than the fat of rams. And that was a, a reference to Leviticus 9.19, where he talks about what a good and acceptable sacrifice looks like. But even if it was good and acceptable, God said to obey is better. But this wasn't even acceptable. This was underhanded and evil and disobedient. It wasn't a good sacrifice. And in verse 23, it says, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord, he has rejected you, Saul, from being king. And from that point on, we get a confession out of Saul that's basically one of those, I'm just sorry because I got caught confessions. And it goes on from there, many more things, but this gives you a wonderful flavor of what this character was like, Saul. And so um, we're going to end it there for, for this week. We're going to reference you to page 477 for discussion questions, either online campus with your family, or if you are um, uh, in a, a Zoom group or an in-home group, you can and go there for your discussion questions. Homework assignment for next week, which is week number 12, is chapter 11. And so read that ahead of time, and uh, you'll be all set for next week, and let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, wow, what a, a, an amazing display of who you are, what you're like, and what we're like, and, and just the amazing character and patience you have with us through this continuing dark time when we just can't seem to get the people of Israel to want to line up under you. But God, you are gracious and your redemption and your grace and mercy is inexhaustible. Uh, your word says your mercies are new every morning and that your grace uh, abounds more where sin abounds. And, and we're so thankful for that. God, just prepare us for next week. 
Let these lessons and these truths sink in and change us. Help us ask ourselves, what about me? How am I like Saul? How am I like Samuel? How am I like Hannah? And uh, help us apply those lessons to our life, and we'll give you thanks in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being with us. Look forward to seeing you next week, and uh, we'll just do everything we can to keep progressing through. Thank you so much for joining us.